already on my bed, Rin. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Sean Meredith. <laughs> But um, I went on Twitter last night, and according to a bunch of old people, you cannot joke about anything anymore. <laughs> which really sucks as a comedian. <laughs> but I'm nothing if not a rebel, so let's get to it. <laughs> Try and avoid anything too controversial. <laughs> too late. <laughs> so, um, I recently made the decision to come out to the public. And it was really brave, in my opinion, because I know what people think about people like me. Theatre kids. They say that we make too many jokes about musicals, too many jokes about gay people, and just generally we're very... <laughs> extra. Which is true, but you don't have to say it. But um, I think we've got a nice little community going here, to be honest. It's nice being around people who actively try not to be racist. It's a rarity if you meet the general public. Um, I think it all stems because a lot of us saw 2007's hit movie, Hairspray, starring John Travolta. And we just thought, mm, this racism malarkey. And then we tried to put it on at school and we went, oh no, we're part of the problem. Because <laughs> we do all know that one guy who did it back in secondary school and it's a bit sus, but they always like, oh no, don't worry, it was completely respectful before they show you a cast photo and half of them are in blue shirts and half of them are in red. <laughs> and it's like, it's not the same. <laughs> I find it a bit difficult for us to be a bit more inclusive, because it's usually just a bunch of white people standing there like the twins in The Shining, and it's just like, join us. <laughs> I love Jennifer Hudson in Dreamgirls. <laughs> I would have voted for Obama a third time if I could. <laughs> I feel like there's more jokes I could make there, but we're gonna cut it close, because I was part of a production of The Producers a few years ago. <laughs> And there are a thousand pictures of me with swash stickers, so we really don't want to <laughs> don't want to worry about that. How about we move on to something that I do know about being queer as shit, <laughs> but obviously not pitch. <laughs> yes, I am an out and proud bisexual woman, as most of the women are here are today. <laughs> um, being bi means that obviously I am bilingual. I love to ride my bicycle and I absolutely love eating pussy. <laughs> but one of the conversation that pops up a lot nowadays I think is this weird rivalry of what is bisexuality versus pansexuality. I get questions all the time, strangers come up to me in the street and it's like, Sean, what is the difference? And I say, thank you for your question, good sir. <laughs> Let me answer it in the form of a joke. Knock, knock. Nunya. Nunya business. <laughs> Um, I want to emphasise before I say anything here that obviously both sexualities are completely beautiful and completely valid um, but when the conversation comes up in the media or just general talk or when you just try and have a peaceful day at the park then it often comes down to bisexuals love genitals and pansexuals are floating orbs of love and acceptance. <laughs> Which, <laughs> as we know, <laughs> It's a bit more complicated than that. Um, you'll have to excuse me, I did write this quite late, so we're just catching up. Just imagine me screaming as I think. <laughs> um, yeah, it's one of those things that the um, discussion always comes across and makes bisexual people seem, for lack of a better term, transphobic, which is ridiculous because my sexuality does not make me transphobic. 
The Deathly Hallows tattoo on my shoulder is what makes me trans. <laughs> but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Uh, what I think is it just does end up being a very personal thing. Because for me, I came out when I was maybe seven, very confident, and bisexual was just the term that existed at the time. So you could say that I'm bi in the same way that I use Hotmail. <laughs> it's what I'm used to. I feel comfortable with it. I'll be a cold, dark day in hell before I call it Outlook. <laughs> <laughs> really, I think it's a topic that should usually just be left alone. Honestly, to me, the comparison is kind of like a dead baby joke. Stick with me. <laughs> there is someone out there with the finesse and tact to cover the subject, but you probably shouldn't do it. And we're moving on to the third thing, because if you hadn't noticed, I'm very addicted to my three-act structures. I'm just not very good at the transition parts. <laughs> Another thing that I really do adore about the community is, as we've also seen today, we do love to talk about mental health. We're very good at talking about it, expressing ourselves, encouraging good behaviours, encouraging bad behaviours as well if we need to. But just generally, I think that it creates an open environment and it got to the point where I myself thought maybe I should start seeing a therapist. And then Encanto came out on Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided if I listen to surface pressure about three to four times a day, <laughs> it's much cheaper and you get the same thing out of it. <laughs> Have we all, uh, I heard applause. Have we all heard the Encanto soundtrack? Watched it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, that's gonna make this much easier. <laughs> Well, for the three people who are not in the know, this song in particular that I'm addicted to, it's the story of a hella hench queen who is suffering under the pressure of family expectations because of a gift that she had when she was younger, while she has an entourage of donkeys and TikTok dancers. <laughs> Which I think we can all identify with a little bit, the golden child syndrome, just that Everyone in school said you were really quiet, so why are you earning barely minimum wage? Pop, pop. <laughs> Most of those expectations, by the way, are not put on me by my family, but more myself. It is very much like, you could read a lot, why are you not a lawyer? I don't want to be a lawyer, but why? My family actually were very discouraging of that dream. It was just like, no, oh, sweetie, no. You don't talk to people. <laughs> it's gonna go very badly. <laughs> Which is why they're so surprised they can't get me to shut the fuck up now. <laughs> One of the things, actually, I did have a conversation with my mother recently, and she did say, I find it very fascinating that we could not get you to talk in public for so long, and here you are, voluntarily doing stand-up. How brave. And I said, well, what she does not know is that while you're here, you tend to be imagining yourself in the corner over there, just sort of, ah! She says, well then, why not not do stand-up? And I say, well, if I'm in a room and I'm not trying to be the funniest person for 10 fucking minutes, then I'll be in that corner, just sort of, ah! <laughs> Now, honestly, I think it's a really great thing to get into stand-up, it's cathartic especially when you feel like you have kind of repressed yourself for multiple decades. It's nice to be able to stand in a room, get attention, express yourself, and get out there in the world. Much like John Travolta in 2007's hit film, Hairspray. <laughs> Thank you.